Hello, I'm Morgan Pacma, Editor-in-Chief of City and State, and this is Last Look. Today, our guest is Jesse Ventura, the former governor of Minnesota and the author of They Killed Our President, 63 Reasons to Believe There Was a Conspiracy to Assassinate JFK. Governor, thank you so much for joining us. Nice to be here. Governor, at this point, is there anybody who doesn't believe there was a conspiracy to assassinate JFK? I believe you say in your book that 80% of Americans don't believe that Oswald acted alone. Yeah, even the government said it. With their second investigation, the House Select Committee in the mid-70s came to a conclusion of a probable conspiracy. They turned it over to the Justice Department. And of course, it's prob that paper is probably still gathering dust at the Justice Department because they do nothing. And people need to understand, if they don't already, there's no statute of limitations on murder. You know, if you murdered someone 50 years ago, you can be still brought up on trial today for it. There's no limitation on it. And uh, uh, f yeah, uh, polls say that four out of five Americans do not believe the Warren Commission. Well, it's our job to get that fifth one. You know, to get it as close to 100%, that's what I feel my job is with this book. And, and I think anyone that reads this book I don't know how they could possibly walk away from this book and still feel that Oswald acted alone. President Johnson is on the cover of your book. Do you think that he was complicit in the assassination? First of all, let's, let's discuss it. There were two conspiracies that took place. There was the actual conspiracy to murder the president, and then there was a conspiracy to cover it up immediately and thereafter, and that conspiracy is still going today. In fact, mainstream media, for the most part, is part of that conspiracy. Uh, so those two took place. And often you get this question, here's one I get all the time, well, someone would have talked. In this 50 years, if there was a conspiracy, someone would have talked. Sounds logical, right? They have talked. Many people have talked. The problem is mainstream media won't cover it. I tell you today, they could come out with an authentic film of somebody there who filmed the grassy knoll. You could see the, the shot fired, the whole thing, and I guarantee you mainstream media wouldn't cover it. You want to know why? On my show, Conspiracy Theory, <clears throat> we had the confession of E. Howard Hunt of Watergate fame confessed to his son, St. John Hunt, on his deathbed, still very lucid, and he confessed. He said, I was an outside player in the CIA. It was called the big event. He, he named David Sanchez, Morales, uh, 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 Cord Meyer, and all these the intimate inside players. He said, I was a bench guy on it. Now, I thought when we aired that on my show, that, it w that there should have been a headline in every American paper, Hunt admits to involvement of JFK, involvement in JFK slaying, not a word. I was stunned, not one word. And the media tries to paint you as some sort of crazy conspiracy theorist? Well, they try to marginalize you. That's what happens. If, if you question the government's official stories today, you're marginalized. They try to make you out that you're some sort of, and, and, they, and we'll show you in this book how this, that was the CIA's plan, to take the words conspiracy theorist and make it so that the general public feels when you're branded with that, that you now have no credibility, that you're a flake, that you're this and that. And remember also, they will put out a lot of crazy conspiracies with it to help do that to the real conspiracy. You know, the, if they saturate with all these wild, crazy things, well then pretty says, well, he's just another one of them crazy conspiracy theorists who believe anything. This book, that's why I led off in this book with the Katzenbach memo. Have you read it? Yes. That was the official memo from the government Monday morning. Now, naturally, Bobby didn't come into work Monday, Bobby Kennedy. His brother had just been killed Friday. I think he took the day off. So Nicholas Katzenbeck was the acting attorney general. That was his memo to new President Lyndon Johnson telling, we must convince the public Oswald acted alone. We must convince them that there were no conspirators or no one out there yet. And we must convince them that had there been a trial, he would have been convicted. And then it goes on and on into, into even more things as the memo continues. 
what more do you need? And the government themselves, in the, uh, their, their second investigation, the House Select Committee on Assassinations in the mid-70s, their conclusion was conspiracy. And Robert F. Kennedy Jr. recently said that his father didn't believe the findings of the Warren Commission. And I commend him. He's, he's one of the first Kennedys now. I guess it's taken three generations now before some of them are starting to speak out. Well, let's go back and look at Jackie Kennedy. She never said a thing about it, hardly, but she said one quote. She said, they murdered my husband. She didn't say he murdered my husband. She used plural. They murdered my husband, and she was sitting right next to him. You can bet she has a pretty good idea where the shots came from. I'll give you another example. Mr. Newman. Everybody's seen him on the Zabruder film. He's the guy covering his family on the ground. You'll see him laying across his two young boys. I interviewed him. He was physically, other than the government or Jackie Kennedy, he was physically the closest civilian to the fatal headshot. And he said the, the bullet came over his shoulder, which went right back to the grassy knoll. <clears throat> Get this. Now imagine you're doing a police investigation. The closest witness to the fatal headshot didn't even interview him. Didn't even bring him in. Once he made the statement to the FBI of where he thought the shots came from, he's out the door. We're not talking to him. Several months ago, I interviewed Robert Caro, and I've, I've read all of his years of Lyndon Johnson. And certainly on the eve of the assassination, Johnson was in a very precarious position. The Bobby Baker scandal was on the verge of breaking out. A series of very damning articles were on the verge of being printed. And yet when I asked Robert Caro if there were any reason to believe that Johnson was involved in the assassination, he said, I have read everything that I possibly could, I've spoken to everyone I can, and, and there's just no evidence of Johnson being involved in the assassination. Uh, what do you say to that? I say that that's baloney. I'd say he's covering up too, he won't take the final step. Lyndon Johnson was neck deep in two, the Billy Saul Estes scandal and the Bobby Baker scandal. Plus there was a heavy rumors that Kennedy was going to drop him from the ticket in 64. Well, Lyndon Johnson wanted to be president more than anything in the world. So, just to be clear, do you think that Johnson was complicit in the conspiracy, or did he have an active role in planning it? Really, that's up to the reader and the people to come to that conclusion. Do I think he was? Yes. Personally, yes. You decided not to run for a second term as governor of Minnesota. At the time, you said it was because of the toll that the media was taking on your family. No. Uh, no. What, what was the reason? Uh, I never talked about it because it was personal. My wife had some health issues. Mm -hmm. And I will always put my wife ahead of being in one of these offices or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So that was the, I, but I didn't want to go public with that because the media would slaughter you anyway and they'd distort it and they'd do whatever else they could and it was a private situation. Today I can talk about it. She's doing much, much better mm -hmm. and it's everything's fine. And so, uh, uh, but I chose to keep things, some things private for at least a decade mm -hmm. because uh, if you don't, I, I think you, uh, with today's media and a position like I'm in, you need to protect yourself from them. So it wasn't just disillusionment with the way that our government operates with the two-party system? You mean the two-party dictatorship? Yeah, uh, yes, I guess. <laughs> if you well, they make the way. rules. How come no one else can debate? Because they get to decide that. Why should the Democrats and Republicans get to decide who debates? How come it's their choice? And where's the media on this? How come the media doesn't demand more than two people debating? And that people need to know. When you elect a president today from the Democrats or Republicans, it doesn't matter because the money people have gone to both of their conventions and paid off their bets on both sides, so it don't matter to them who wins. They've got their bets covered. What do you think are the fundamental structural changes that have to be made to push back against the two-party system? Uh, well, you see, the answer is as clear as the nose on your face, but it's as difficult as climbing up Mount Everest stop voting for Democrats and Republicans. We have that power. The power is still ours. But getting people to do that is the difficulty because as I said, oh, you've wasted your vote. And besides, everyone wants to be on the winning side. That's kind of human nature. So people like to look and say, well, yes, I voted for so-and-so, whoever won. 
you know, so that they can, uh, well, like, well, like polls today. Polls today say there's more independents than there are Democrats and Republicans. So why isn't there a third candidate for all of those independent voters who choose not to be Democrat or Republican and are forced? Like the words of the late, great Jerry Garcia, the Grateful Dead, said, when you're made to pick the lesser of two evils, you're still picking evil. What do you think about Michael Bloomberg? He was elected as a Republican and he became an independent. He's not an independent. What is he? You don't become one. You win an election as one. He won as a Republican. And just because halfway through you decide to change your spots, that don't make you an independent. Win an election as an independent, then you're an independent. You are... And Michael Blomberg also changed your system here and got term limits taken away so he could do it again. He didn't want to abide by the rules. He, he needed to change them to stay in power. Are there any elected officials right now, Democrats or Republicans, who you respect? Politically? Politically. Probably not. The only, there's only two guys in federal office right now, that uh, Bernie Sanders and Angus King, the two independents in the Senate. Angus was an independent governor with me, but he didn't get the press I got. But there were two of us, actually. And Angus was actually in his second term, Governor King. And you endorsed uh, Angus King? Oh, absolutely. Well, I didn't I need to endorse him. He's up in Maine. I'm in Minnesota. What do they care in Maine about a, me in Minnesota for? But I will say this. Notice this. At nearly every election, you will see Maine and Minnesota lead the nation in voter turnout. And Maine and Minnesota were the two states that elected independent governors. Is that what you think, that the two major parties suppress voter turnout in order to keep their dominance? Absolutely, they do. Absolutely, they do. Every state should have same-day registration like Minnesota. You know how I knew I was going to win that day? Word came back to us the line to register to vote was longer than the lines to vote that day. And I knew people weren't coming out of the woodwork to vote for Democrats and Republicans. I knew they were coming out of the woodwork to vote for me. Plus the uh, uh, Secretary of State, they predicted that year, it was, it was non-presidential that year, they predicted a 50% voter turnout in Minnesota that year. It ended up 60, okay? I was polling 27% going into the election. I won with 37%. Don't those numbers 10% more than they predicted? And I won by 10, I went up 10%. Those were all the people they didn't expect to vote that did. And the majority of those people were young people who they don't usually expect to vote. But they couldn't understand why I went out and campaigned on college campuses. Because as the third entity, I knew I needed to get, don't go after Democrats and Republics, go after the people that you don't expect to vote. Get them to vote, inspire them to vote. That's how you'll win. You said recently that you're contemplating running for president in 2016. Would your aim be to win or to call attention to some of the fundamental problems that you see with our country? I don't waste my time calling attention to problems when I run. I always run to win. I run to win. Well, why would you run with Howard Stern as your vice presidential nominee then? Because there's a method to my madness, and I'll tell you why. I'm not shy about it. <clears throat> when I ran for governor of Minnesota, I had a statewide talk radio show. The FCC made me go unemployed for six months, so I had no income for six months while my two opponents were collecting government checks because they already held one government office, and now they're going for another one. So clearly they're not doing the job that they were elected to because if they, they spent as much time campaigning as I did, which is usually 16 hours a day. How can you spend 16 hours a day campaigning for another job and still do the job you're elected to do? They're not that important then, are they? If they can care, if the attorney general don't need to be there and the mayor of St. Paul didn't need to be there, they could be out campaigning. Getting back to your question. I lost my job. Well, Howard Stern's on Sirius Radio. They don't, they don't fall under the FCC. We could use Howard's radio show right up to Election Day as our major platform. Plus, Howard and I have already discussed it. I despise what our country's turned into, the concept of bribery. That's what our entire election process is, bribery. You do that in the private sector, you go to jail. Public sector, status quo. I hate it. 
and I actually raised, I made more money doing the job than I raised to get it. I'm the only elected official, I bet, in 50 to 100 years that can say that in a major election. Howard Stern already said to me, leave the fundraising to me, good. Because I took no PAC money when I was governor, I took no special interest money, and here's another thing for you. The four years I was governor, I never met with a lobbyist once. My first day in office, I told my staff, lobbyists are banned, don't even schedule them, I'm not meeting with them. They didn't elect me, I don't need them. You see why they needed me out? I was destroying their jobs because they're, a lobbyist's whole job is to gain access to that public official and bribe them. That's what their whole job is so that they can get what they want. That didn't happen for four years in Minnesota. There was no more bribing going on. Lobbyists never saw the light of day with me. And by Howard Stern, well, how much money you think Howard could raise on his radio show if he went to his listeners and said, we need 10 bucks a piece? Probably quite a lot. And that and 10 bucks isn't going to get you much influence, is it? You had one New York-born senator in Minnesota, Norm Coleman, who you defeated in the governor's race. You know what's kind of funny about Norm Coleman? What is that? Think of who he lost to. He lost to a wrestler and a comedian. (laughs) And now you have Al Franken as your senator. Uh, How do you think he's done? Surprisingly very good. I, you know, I, I, I give Al Frank, and he surprised me a little bit. He's taken the job very seriously. He, he's been very much under the radar, probably much the way he wrote, you know, in his own way. He was a writer, uh, you know, the comedy for Saturday Night Live, and that he was a behind-the-scenes guy. You never really saw Al Frank in a whole lot in front of the camera, you know, trading places. He had the little part in there and that. But uh, plus, I, I, I commended uh, Senator Franken when he voted against the defense bill because in that last defense bill, they, they had a caveat in there put in by McCain and I forget the guy from uh, Levin from Michigan that allows the military now to run free in our streets. Franken voted against it because of that. I called his office and I said, way to go. Who do you think is to blame for the government shutdown? Uh, mostly the Republicans, but both. The Republicans are clearly to blame, but re- remember, they work together. I've all, I, when I taught at Harvard, one of my classes was how pro wrestling prepares you for politics. And I told all my Harvard students, I said, politics with the Democrats and Republicans is identical to pro wrestling. In front of the camera, they hate each other. Behind the scenes, they're working together. That's what you got here. This is all a big scam in my opinion. In this particular issue, the Democrats are going to be the baby faces and the Republicans are going to be the heels, like in the world of pro wrestling. And But they're they're all together on it. They, you know, as, I like to quote Ralph Nader when he said the two-party dictatorship. And, and let me be clear on that too. When you run as a third candidate, they love to say you're the spoiler, you ruined the election. That's the biggest garbage in the world. People vote for you because they want you to be president. They're not voting. And, and that's another thing. People, you should vote for someone, not against someone. Vote for someone. You brought a lawsuit against the TSA alleging that what they do is illegal search and seizure. One no, of the big... reasonable search and seizure. Reasonable is the key word. Not well, illegal. Is it re- the way the Fourth Amendment says is reasonable Reason. search and seizure. I claimed it was not reasonable to believe I'm a threat. And right A now, reasonable person wouldn't think it. Well, do you think I am? Uh, no, I don't. There you go. And you're reasonable. And <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad you think so. Well, I th- you sound reasonable and to me. One of the main issues this year in the New York City mayoral campaign has been stop and frisk. What do you think about the constitutionality of, of stop and frisk? I don't know that much about it, but I, I, if you have no probable cause, I think it's horrible. And that's the problem. The Democrats and Republicans, our, our Bill of Rights is in shambles. Let's go back to the Wall Street protesters. The First Amendment guarantees them the right to protest. Your government guarantees it. Whether you agreed with them or not, you should have supported them because of that right alone. Because someday you may want to protest. Well, now you can't do that. They've passed a law. They can throw you in jail in this country now for protesting. That's despicable. Where's the Bill of Rights there? And then, of course, you got the Democrats trying to take away the Second Amendment rights. You notice this pattern? They wouldn't let me to go to court on the Fourth Amendment. 
The First Amendment, free speech and willing to protest, that's out of the way now. They're, they're, they're totally destroying the Bill of Rights, and we the people are letting them do it. Letting them do it. Because it's absurd. You should have the right to protest as long as it's not violent. You're, and the Wall Street people weren't violent. Yet what happened to them? They ran them off with pepper spray and dogs. For what reason? Simply because they were bringing to bear shining a light on the thieves on Wall Street. And I found it interesting. Nobody went to jail on Wall Street. Protesters went to jail but nobody on Wall Street. You know what I would do, too, if I was president? What is that? One of the first things I'd do, I'd pardon Bradley Manning, and I'd pardon the other guy. Edward Snowden? Yeah. Because whistleblowers who blow the whistle when the government's breaking the law, with Snowden, they were breaking the law and lying about it, should not be, they are heroes. They should not go to jail or be, have the government chasing them and making a guy go to live in a foreign country now because he, 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 he felt patriotic to show the American people what the government was doing to them. That, he's a hero. He is not a villain. With your views, if you ran for president, would you be afraid of being assassinated? That's why I picked Howard. So Howard Stern wouldn't be the president? No, he's an insurance policy. <laughs> that way they're not going to kill me and put Howard in, are they? You've been highly critical of the mainstream media. Do you think it's the reporters themselves who are trying to obfuscate the truth, or do you think it's the media moguls behind them? Moguls, because they'll fire the reporters, or they'll, the reporters will be disciplined if they... If they well, I went, into the, I went into the CBS affiliate in Minnesota, when they were passing this defense bill that was going to allow the military, the amendment to it that McCain and Levin put on that allows the military to free wheel in our own country now, I went to the Minnesota CBS affiliate and I said, why are you making me do your job? Why aren't the people being made aware of this amendment on the defense bill? The reporter took it all down I said, and she said, well, I can't guarantee it'll go upstairs and we'll see. Never got on the air. Here's Jesse Ventura telling him and didn't put it on, never got on the air. So it's the moguls controlling it. And, and it's also the government themselves controlling the media. If mainstream media doesn't do what the government or the elected officials want, they won't get access. Then they're dead in the water. So therefore, in order to do their job and earn their paycheck and get access to these elected officials, they have to kowtow to them. They, that's what you have today. <clears throat> Remember this, when they formed our country, the media was supposed to be the unwritten fourth branch of government. That, and they're failing in their role. They're horribly failing in their role. They were supposed to be the branch of government that kept an eye on the judicial, legislative, and executive branches. They were the ones that were supposed to report back to the people, keeping them under wraps. Now that they've lost that role, we're in big trouble because there's nobody now keeping track of what they're doing and doing it honestly because, they, they, again, it's about jobs and you'll lose access. And you're a reporter. What good are you if you can't get access? That's absolutely true. Um, well, then if we can't trust the Democrats and we can't trust the Republicans and we can't trust the media, who can we trust? Me? No, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I believe that our country was formed, and, and it's our fault. It's our fault, the people, because we're supposed to be vigilant. When they formed our great country, it was with that intact that the people were supposed to be vigilant, hold their feet to the fire, pay attention. I'll tell you this, if you don't hold government's feet to the fire, if you do, you'll get good government. If you don't, you will get bad government, and we're getting bad government. Governor Ventura, thank you so much for joining us. And that's it for this episode of Last Look. For more episodes, please join us on the web at cityandstateny.com.